Hello everyone and welcome to the Blood Red podcast, a bank holiday special after the 2-2 draw against Arsenal. I'm Sean Bradbury back in the hosting seat after a little while, a little, little absence, a little hiatus from the pod. So I've been saving myself really, waiting for Liverpool to play well again and, and they certainly did that at Anfield on Sunday in that second half. So joining me to discuss thrilling game, we have our Liverpool correspondent Paul Ghost and Reds writer Theo Squires. Ghosty, happy Easter to you. How's your weekend been? Um... Yeah, it was good actually. Yeah, it, it was working, working good Friday. We had Jürgen's press conference, didn't we? And then uh, Saturday off, and then back to Anfield on Sunday. For the first time since the United game, actually, it feels like a long time ago now, doesn't it? That 7 0 7 0 historic hammering of United. Um, but yeah, I'm sure as, as we'll get into it a little bit more, it was um, a, a good performance from Liverpool from about the 40th minute onwards, wasn't it? Once they started to respond to the crowd and whatever else. Um, and I actually came away from Anfield yesterday on, on Easter Sunday thinking, no, I wasn't actually too bothered that they, they you know, didn't win it or, or whatever. It was more just seeing a little bit of fight from them that, that has been, you know, severely lacking in recent weeks. So me and Donny walked through Stanley Park yesterday and um, I was in a better mood than I had been coming away from Anfield at various points across the season, apart from that uh, famous 7-0 win. That's a, that's a lovely image, the two of you skipping through Stanley Park <laughs> arm in arm. The Reds making you happy. That's what we like to hear. And, and Theo, obviously the football will come on to, but any any Easter highlights, any good chalky eggs or anything? Um, I've not even had a chance to open any because you've had me working all four days. So <laughs> it's just been powering on. Um, but yeah, the same as what Gorsty said with the football. Like It makes you realise it's not so much the results, is it? It's the performance, like the City game. If they'd lost 4-3 but put in a real fight, you could at least, oh yeah, I enjoyed that game. It's at least against Arsenal. That's what they gave us. Uh, I'm sure our, how our, we feel about the match would have been very different if the final whistle had gone on 35 minutes rather than 90. But it's strange for this season. You're actually going away thinking, that's two points dropped against the league leaders. But yeah, it's been a, a nice snuff Easter weekend, isn't it? Not quite the, the big comeback from Liverpool, but it's close enough. No, absolutely. Well, let's get into it then. Go, so I'll throw to you first. And I, I totally agree with you. I came out of that ground feeling pretty exhilarated by by football and by an Anfield performance for the first time in a little while because I missed, missed the United game, was working for that one. And it just felt to me like the kind of draw that you can be positive about. You know, that's very legitimate and feels like the type of game that Klopp can use as a bit of a reference point. You know, the crowd was good. The players put a bit of a rousing comeback in. You know, it, it's not quite one he's going to get them with their arms waving in front of the cop again, like, you know, the West Brom game back in 2015. But, yeah. you know, I don't, think, I don't think it's far off that in terms of... Um, the, the impact it could have. So I suppose question to you to start it off is that that last 50 minutes of the game, you know, I think that's the essence of what's been missing all season for Liverpool, you know, the way they came back, the attitude, the application, and it, it just needs Klopp to bottle that and release that for every remaining game and take that into the next campaign. But yeah. do you have confidence that that can happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, isn't it? It's, um, I've written something for, for the, the site actually later this afternoon along those lines. Um, Kind of like, you know, Liverpool, Liverpool fans have to hear it every game, you know, where's your famous atmosphere? You know, it doesn't matter who's in the way, and they're always singing that one, and, and you think, well, it's reserved specifically for, for the big games now. It tends to be Liverpool, when it, when Anfield gets get, get its blood up and, and the, the fans respond and, you know, it's it's kind of fettel in the ground, that's when the players respond to that, but it's a bit of a chicken and an egg thing, you know, it, you know do the fans... Do the fans get the atmosphere going and the players respond to it, or is it the players who need to do something on the pitch to, to basically get the fans on the terraces going? It's a it's a bit of a strange one, really. There's, there's no kind of defined thing on, on, on how it happens, but certainly yesterday <clears throat> it happened when Granit Xhaka foolishly threw out a bit of an elbow at Trent Alexander Arnold, and um, from that moment on, everything in the ground was transformed. You know, Liverpool started. Putting a, putting a foot in, you know, it's, it sounds sounds basic, it sounds, you know, very, you know, proper football man type stuff, but they just started throwing in a few tackles and looking like they wanted to win the 50-50s and suddenly Gabriel Jesus is getting booted up left and right and he's getting left on the floor and he's, he's moaning about his back and the fans are, are kind of rallying against that and it all just kind of snowballed from, from there on in and, and it actually spilled off into the half-time interval when Andy Robertson kind of accosts um, Constantine Adzadakis, is that how you say it? I'm sure we'll come on to that in a bit. But then the second half, the fans didn't let up either, and, and Liverpool were, were superb in the second half. I, I think they deserved to win. 
you know, Canate bundles that one at the end. You're talking about a, a famous comeback win against the league leaders. And uh, I'm just delighted to see some character, some some fights, some fire in the bellies, you know, all these kind of things that have just been absent for Liverpool for, for a long time. You know, I think they've proven in games such as Rangers away, and Manchester United and Bournemouth that when they get a little bit of a roll, a bit of a momentum, they can still put sides to the sword in kind of impressive fashion. But as soon as things go against them, whether it's a little setback here, a decision there, a, a mistake there, a goal, they, they tend to go into the shells and, and you know, cower and it's not the Liverpool that we've become used to seeing on the clock. So, Yesterday was a, a massive departure from what we've seen in recent weeks and months, and um, it just has to be the, the kind of blueprint for going forward. Now the kind of ability to respond, the desire to to want to respond to setbacks, and okay, top four for me is, is, is gone now. You know, wouldn't make much of a difference if Liverpool were the one that yesterday anyway for me. But um, it's just something to to uh, to use going forward. You know, a, a strong end to the season now and then going to an all important summer, which. Um, I think we'll, we're expecting quite a few kind of personnel changes, aren't we? But also maybe an attitude change as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Theo, virtually every time we've watched Liverpool this season, I think a different question has sprung up, or you know, certainly in recent months and weeks where it's really dropped off. You know, whether it's a worrying dip for one player that you think is is it is it short term, is it long term, a positional concern around someone. Maybe even a tactical doubt about you know what plan A is now, what Klopp is trying to do, mentality issues as well. But as Gorsi said, did this feel a bit different? Did this feel like something more of a blueprint and a, and a platform to build on? Potentially, like when they drew nil nil with Chelsea, Klopp came out and said that's the basis. It's something they can build on. But that was just like they had a bit of passion, they had a bit of uh, identity, intensity. You know those same words we hear week in, week out from Liverpool when it's not going particularly well this season. We've heard management say number of times, but against Arsenal, you actually saw it in that second half. Like first half, I think that they were creating a lot of spaces, weren't they, in for Arsenal to attack, and that's where the two goals come from when they're doing this little uh, tactical tweak with Trent as the inverted fullback. And you think, you know, oh, this isn't Liverpool. We've not seen them do this before. Is this just a reaction to, oh, you're battered by City last week. This is how City play. This is how Arsenal play. We're going to go and copy you and hope for the best. But then when we got to, what, 35 minutes in, 40 minutes in, it started to work. They started to get Trent on the ball, ball, on the ball more and it just started to control the game. Like they had a bit of pride in themselves. You think, where, where's this been all season long? Like you've obviously got the ability deep down within and it's not just a case of, oh, Liverpool fans wait to turn the atmosphere on. The players waiting to turn it on as well. They can bring it on against uh, United when I'll oh, get a couple of uh, state, uh, bragging rights there with the 7-0 victory or Arsenal are oh, 2-0 down. We don't want to get a spanking here in front of our home fans. There's obviously something there within for them to build on. You need that for the final weeks of the season now. I, as Gorsi says, top four is probably gone. They're, what, 12 points off, 27 left to play for. I know it's a similar-ish situation to a couple of years ago where they were unbeaten from the last 10. I think they drew two of those last 10. So they could technically do the exact same points all now if they've gone on unbeaten run. But when you look at the gap to United, the gap to Newcastle, it just seems too much to do. So the big task now is make sure that this is just one season of transition, that you're bringing in the new bodies in the summer, moving on some of the older players, and then Liverpool go again in the new season. Like They've got this reclaimed identity, and that is something they can work with. The question, though, going forward is, what is the formation going forward? Like, Are we now going to see Trent as this inverted right fullback? Um, yeah, right fullback. For the majority, is this a new role so we can see him almost in midfield, but also be out wide? Or is this just something they're going to use in the odd game, depending when it suits the systems? Um, the pros and cons to it against Arsenal. And Klopp said it's something the players need to adapt to. It's something they need to work with. Well, if we haven't already got much to play for for the final month, six weeks of the season, at least they've got time to do that, then it's a full pre-season. And you're just hoping with new faces that this is the starting for making sure Liverpool come again stronger next year, whether they're in Europa League, Europa Conference League, out of Europe altogether. At least they can be challenging for that Premier League title again. And we'll just remember this season as one horrible nightmare that we don't have to look back on too often. There, there was a there was an incident in, in the second half. You know, I think it, it should be to Everton fans. They always mention a, a game against United years ago when Phil Neville puts in a, a thunderous tackle on Ronaldo. And I can't remember whether they go on to win the game or, or they, they kind of come back and, and get a, a really deserved point from or, or whatever it is. But it's kind of like a famous incident for Everton fans in, in recent years. 
it got Goodison up and, and all of a sudden the, the game was totally transformed from United just strolling around and doing what they wanted. And there was an incident in the second half that was similar to that where Canate throws one in on was a checker in possession. Uh, and Liverpool win it high up the pitch and Salah and Gakpo kind of created a decent chance. And that that reminded me of that a little bit where Canate just decided enough was enough and just put in an almighty, you know, wins it clean as a whistle, but it's very strong. Um, one you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of, to be fair. And from there, Liverpool just seemed to gain so much momentum from that. And um, they were unlucky not, not to go and win the game in the end, to be fair. And, you know, being two goals down to a team who started the weekend eight points clear um, shows you that they can still mix it with, with the, the best in this league. They're not a busted flush. You know, they've beaten United 7-0. They beat City at home. They've, should, they've just drawn with Arsenal and they probably should have won. Um, so they can do it. It's just the case of when you see them losing at Notts Forest or, or Nottingham Forest, rather, or when you see Leeds United coming to Anfield and winning, or they lose a Bournemouth having beaten them 9-0 a few months earlier. It, is it an attitude thing? I'm not sure. It's something you haven't really been able to accuse Liverpool of with the club, but it's not having the right attitude at the right time or the right mentality or concentration. But you're wondering now... Is is that an issue that, that's been there all season? Because they can clearly still do it when they they, they, have, they have to, or you know, or not, when things are kind of going in their favour. So um, maybe that's something for, for Klopp to look at a bit deeper in the summer. I don't know how you do that, but um, it's maybe one to look at. This means maybe. they've got like no excuses going into the next game when you think about it, because it's what Leeds on a Monday night, so they've got a full week of training, technically got an extra day of training to get ready for this one. Uh, it's not like the Bournemouth game where it's an early kickoff, so they've not got the excuse there. And yes, it's an away game, and they've been rubbish away from home this season. But still, Ellen Road under the lights when they're in a relegation battle, their fans are going to be up for that. They they need the points, and with Leeds as well, they've just been spanked five one by Palace. So it's like, well, this is a chance for Liverpool to go out and actually build on it. They can't just be an isolated good performance here, an isolated good performance there. They need to get that consistency and put a run together. And usually, I think we've, we've all joked at some point, oh, Liverpool are going to get battered by Leeds now just because they got spanked by Palace. They need, they need to respond. But maybe it is that platform where Liverpool can go, right, we were really good for 50 minutes against Arsenal. Now we can bring it forward. And once they find a way to get that rhythm, get that consistency, if they can put in a few positive displays in a row, now it's not a case of, are you doing this to get in the Champions League? It's just have a bit of pride in yourself so we can go stronger for next year. It makes you feel a bit more positive going into that summer break. Mm. I'd like you say, I'd almost certainly prefer to be in Liverpool's position right now in terms of, you know, you've got a little bit more time to work on this new tweaked formation ahead of Leeds, if that's what they stick with. Rather than Leeds, you've got to stew on, as you say, Theo, a very heavy defeat. Well, let's get into a little bit more about a couple of individuals, which you've already mentioned. But I wanted to start with Kanate and Alexander-Arnold, whose games, I thought, started off maybe a little bit shakily. You know, there were some of the... At the scene of some of the crimes a little bit, maybe early on, you know, perhaps not for the for the for the first goal so much, but just um, or even that. Well, yeah, it was probably more Van Dijk and Robertson in the middle for that second one, but just some general things in play. I didn't think were quite right, but as they grew into the game, the, the roles were kind of interestingly kind of intertwined with this with this little change we saw. But can I say first of all, Gorsty? I mean, by the end, I think he was the game's dominant figure, wasn't he? Maybe Ramsdale from an Arsenal perspective would have yeah. claims to that as well. But most ball recoveries for Liverpool, he's got eight of them. Most successful tackles, I think, was him with five. Most interceptions with three. You know, he was he was everywhere on the pitch. And I had a look at just the minutes that he's played this season in the Premier League, and I think it was only it only amounts to ten more than Matip so far across the course of that of the campaign. I think I think it's only ten starts or something like that. I mean, mm. you see him play like that, particularly second half, and it just shows how much Liverpool have missed him. Yeah, it's been it's been one of the big problems for Liverpool all season. That's almost kind of gone under the radar. The fact that him and Van Dijk haven't been able to to play enough together at centre back. Um, obviously, Van Dijk had that hamstring issue that he picked up with Brentford, and Canate um, was out earlier in the season, wasn't he? Got injured in that friendly against Strasbourg, was it in late July? Um, being managed at certain points. Uh, so it, it has been a, a, a lamentable aspect of the season that the first two centre-backs haven't played too many minutes together. And, and, and like you say, he's only played 10 more than Matip. Um, so, yeah, that has been frustrating. But I thought Canate was, was superb yesterday. Certainly second half. Um, 
he, he allowed Trent to play a little bit further forward in that kind of almost number six role, wasn't it? Like Theo says, the kind of inverted fullback role. Um, and then that's where you get the best of Alexander Arnold. That ball he put in for Nunes, for, for, funnily enough, for Canate, he really should have stuck it away. That was an unbelievable ball. Um, the bit the skill to get around Zinchenko to set up Firmino. So when when Canate is is able to, you know, when he's fit and, and he's he's on it, he enables uh, Alexander Arnold to be able to do that to just avoid the the tiresome debates about Alexander Arnold's defending. You know, defending's are very much a, a unit thing. Um, so when people say to say about well, Alexander Arnold can't defend and, and this that and the other, it's very much a system thing. And Liverpool had the best record in all of Europe's five leagues last season defensively at them and Manchester City for goals conceded. So you can't be a bad defender if you, you're part of a back four or a back five who are kind of coming up with these kind of numbers. So it's all just part of, of the system that Liverpool haven't really been able to get going at all this season. You know, a lot of that is down to the midfield and, and the lack of energy and the lack of protection at times. Uh, but when it all clicks, um, like it did for, for most of that second half yesterday, you start to see the the good traits in Liverpool's best players. Uh, and I thought Canate was, was superb. Every time Martinelli went down that wing, he was just coming across and almost just shooing him away, like a you know, like he was an under nine player or something, just you know, just muscling him off getting Liverpool back on the ball, like you say, the most ball recoveries and, and all that stuff. So he, he was excellent, he needs a strong finish to the season. Both for, for his and Alexander Arnold's cause, you'd imagine. You know, if those two can can stay fit and continue working in the way they did in the second half, it'll make Liverpool a, a better force, both defensively and, and creatively, really. So uh, that's a really important area of the team, Liverpool, for Liverpool, really, that right centre back and, and right back area. Yeah, and just staying on that, Theo, I, I thought Kanati was perhaps a touch wobbly at the start as he got to grips with this tweak thing that, you know, we've referenced with, with Trent more central and, you know, next to Fabinho, there was a spell, you know, very early on where he was a little bit iffy in possession. I think Martinelli and others like uh, Gabriel Jesus was drifting out to that flank as well. And Arsenal were obviously trying to exploit that as so many teams have done or attempted to do against Liverpool this season, but he grew into the game so impressively. And I know Klopp said this, this double six, this the inverted fullback experiment with Trent. He said, we've seen it before, but you know, even he himself acknowledged it. It wasn't as, as marked and kind of obvious and maybe as kind of fulsomely used by Liverpool as this in, in a single game. How did you feel about that balance in general? And and do you think Kanate could could do that long term? Um, I'm a lot more positive about it at the final whistle than it was after the 30 minutes in when like Liverpool were 2-0 down. Because it, it seemed like Liverpool either had no faith in the system or they just didn't really know where they were supposed to be. I think you could understand that from a certain point of view because they haven't really had much time to work on this behind the scenes in training from the fact that they had Chelsea midweek. Like, we, we could... Take, it, take a look at it and say you dropped so many of the back four because you had this system in mind for your next game and maybe you want them to have a bit more practice on the training ground with it. But that is Klopp 4D chess and that's just speculation. That doesn't mean that was ever the case. Realistically, they've been battered by that system against Man City and then it looks like they've just thrown it in because defensively it's not worked for them this season so they need to try something a bit different. And early on, like Canate and Trent, they just didn't really seem to know where they were supposed to be, when Trent was supposed to be inside, when he was supposed to be at right back, when Canate was supposed to be on that right-hand side. And it created so much space for Arsenal to attack into. Like, whether it was Martinelli going down the wing or Jesus in the middle, like we see for the second goal, it's because Canate is on the right there. You've got that space either side of Van Dijk. And that lets Jesus get in between Van Dijk and Robertson to get a simple header. Like, it was a great cross from Martinelli, puts on a plate for him. But the, there's those spaces there in defence that you shouldn't really expect to see and it's quite surreal to think that when Liverpool have had an issue defensively and you think they've got too many men forward they've not got enough men back they're leaving Trent one-on-one at right back and then the right centre-back gets dragged over and then there's the gaps when the midfield aren't covering but the solution is potentially oh fine just take a man out of there so they're covering even more ground but then when they got to terms to it, it did work. You think, well, Canate can do this. He's got the attributes to do it. Like, he's good on the ball. He's quick. And he's really strong and really tall. So he can bully anyone if he's 
on form. He's confident. We saw him flying into tackles. Remember that, like the viral Colo Torre story from when Arsenal first signed him when he was on trial and he just was winning everything. He didn't care if it was the player or the ball. And he ends up two foot in Arsene Wenger and he goes off in tears thinking he's cost his, his chance of getting a contract with him. It's almost like watching that with Canate. He's like a man possessed. It doesn't matter who was in his way. He was winning that ball and he was starting attacks. And that lifted the ground as well. Like Liverpool still need the right personnel there. Like you think if they have a holding midfielder who can cover the ground more, like Fabinho's legs hadn't started to go, Henderson's legs hadn't started to go, maybe they don't need this tweak. But now it's just about making sure you're a bit more solid defensively. Like We know Trent needs that added bit of protection. We know when Joel Matip's the right centre-back, he can't really give it to him because he doesn't have those that pace that Canate can offer, that Van Dijk can offer, that Gomez can offer. And if you don't have your midfielders being able to cover it, that's where it's created all these spaces for teams to attack. But as Gorsley said, with the injuries, they've not been able to get a consistent back four out there for so long. And when you do get the consistent back four out, they'll get a clean sheet against Manchester United and they'll go and ship four in the second half or four either side half time, sorry, against Man City. So at least against Arsenal, there was that fighting spirit. They did put in a solid defensive display and that they came to terms with their roles. Like they looked, grew in confidence. Canate knew when to push wide. He knew when to say stern troll. Uh, he used his pace brilliantly. He won the ball back really well. And then it was just get Trent on the ball. Let him be that like quarterback role, wasn't it? Pretty much, wasn't it? Spreading it around. It was playing to his strengths. It was playing to Canate's strengths. But they still need to keep working on it so they know when they're supposed to be in these roles, when they've got the protection out wide or inside, so they're not leaving gaps. Because if Liverpool were leaving gaps with Trent out right back that offensive teams can take advantage of, then when you take that player out, there's even more space for them too. You've got to have it absolutely spot on. Something You look at Man City, they do get it spot on. They know exactly what they're doing. And it's something they've been working on for a long, long time. It works with what Guardiola has been doing throughout his career. When you think of Barcelona, Bayern Munich, where it's just, just keep ball past teams to death. Not necessarily how we see Liverpool playing, but it's something they want to be able to do more so they can change from high pressing to possession football. They've got the players for it. It just needs confidence and a few months, I suppose, on the training ground to actually make sure it is something that you can turn to stably and get results from. Just to stick with this, Gorsley, this, you know, this new tactical change, do you think it is the way home for Trent? Because I totally agree with you that the debate around this defending is is tiresome. And I'm not being funny, but if if what he did to Zinchenko had happened the other way around, yeah. that would be, you know, he'd be getting absolutely slaughtered for it. I think Trent very much won the battle of the inverted fullbacks there, you know, eventually as the game wore on. But my one concern, I suppose, with that is, you know, we've seen John Stones do it. We've seen Zinchenko do it. I, I think Trent is great. You know, when, he, when he's been at his best for Liverpool, he's rampaged up and down that that flank and getting, you know, tucking in a little bit more more recently to, to mix the effect. But I almost feel if you're going to push into midfield, you have, especially in this little double six type role, does he have the right kind of technique for it in tight spaces, able to kind of wriggle away from certain players? I think once he's unleashed into a bit of space, then he'd be unstoppable. As you referenced, that one, you know, obviously you got you got the assist for the second, but the one he clipped into Nunes for the for the the one that Canate should have scored. Yeah. He was in that exact type of position, and there was a couple of times I think he had a shot from a similar part yeah. of the pitch. So do you, do you see that as a role he could he could grow into and adapt to? Well, it's the reason why Klopp has resisted calls to play him in midfield for years, really, because he prefers him operating from a, a deeper position, kind of. Coming, coming on to the to where the action is, you know, getting further forward. Um, I, I I didn't see too much difference yesterday in the second half between where he was playing and where he was playing when Liverpool were flying towards the kind of first half of, of last season. You know, he, he was a right back on the kind of team sheet, if you like, but he was definitely operating further forward in more central areas, and Jordan Henderson was using his energy to get, <clears throat> get you know, around the back in the wider positions. We've seen Harvey Elliott do something similar when he plays on that right side of, of the midfield three. Um, I just think ultimately, it's you know, players have weaknesses, players have strengths, and I think Klopp is um, secure enough to know that Alexander Arnold's strengths will outweigh his weaknesses. Of, of course, now and again, you know. Uh, a winger will get will get around the back of him, and and say, I don't think Trent Alexander Arnold's had, had a good season by any stretch, but I don't think too many for Liverpool have really. Um, so when you know like some Martinelli's getting around the man, you know, and you look and you think could he have done better there and, and whatever else, and 
Of course, you know, there are times when he should do better as a defender, but then you look at what he's doing in the, you know, what was it, the 88th minute or whatever it was, you know, he's not nagging his opposite number, he's putting in crosses, setting up game-changing, equalising t- titles, you know, that, that could be a massive goal in the title race, and it all came from Alexander Arnold's ability, so sometimes you just have to, to weigh up the pros and cons of, of a player's game, and certainly for me, I, you know, I'd be suggesting nine times out of ten that Alexander Arnold is the man to be playing at right back. Um, now and again, I think Joe Gomez has proven that he can be solid and, and dependable when needed to be at right back. It doesn't offer anything, you know, it doesn't offer a tenth of what Alexander Arnold offers going forward. That's fair enough. That's just not his game, is it? So it's, um, I mean, I don't think they need to be throwing the, the kind of the baby out of the bathwater there. I think long term, Alexander Arnold is, is fine where he is. Okay, there are elements of his game to work on, of course, but you know, he's only 24 and he's he's just that, you know, being unfair that he's kind of operating in the in the um in the area where you can see every minute of everyone's season and everything's just magnified to the nth degree because of you know how big football is now. You know, Gary Neville's been one of his biggest critics, but I've seen clips of of Gary Neville getting absolutely skinned, you know, for, for when he was playing for United back in the day and um you don't really remember that because it just happened years ago and it's not really dissected anywhere near. No, no, we remember Roy Fowler shoving him over at Old Trafford. Don't pretend we don't go. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's an obvious one, but I was watching one a couple of weeks ago and it was um, it was JJ Cotchin in the Champions League and, and he was he was treating them like a rag doll. He, he, was, he was just skinning them for fun. And imagine if, if that was said, you, you would not hear the end of it. It's just unfortunate that this is the kind of area that we're in, I guess. But um, yeah, I wouldn't be making... I wouldn't be rushing to make any huge sweeping changes to how Alexander operates for Liverpool. You know, when Liverpool are at their best, when everyone is is fit and, and at it, as Graham Tunes might say, he's still the, the most creative player and, and probably the most dangerous player in, in, in the final third by Mo Salah. It's a credit to his vision as a footballer, isn't it? His passing ability. That it doesn't matter if he is just wide right or he is cutting more. He can still pick out anyone. Like one of his assists of the season, granted he hasn't had many this year compared to previous ones, was Wolves in the FA Cup where he just like picked it up on the, what was it, centre circle, took it forward a bit and then just putting that brilliant cross to the far post and like the central roll from deep for Nunes to side foot at home. You know, if we've got them in this hybrid role where he can have the opportunity to go past a fullback, nutmeg them and put in a far post cross, or he can cut inside and do these deeper crosses, you are playing to his strengths. Like when he was at his absolute best, getting you know, more assists than anyone apart from maybe Kevin De Bruyne, it was here's Liverpool's Kevin De Bruyne, but he's playing from right back. It's like, well, De Bruyne has got that such vision, he can pick out those passes from anywhere on the pitch. Well, if you're playing as a right back, you're obviously rarely going to get the chance to do it from the left hand side from central roles it is very much a, you know what you're going to do because you're on that one side of the pitch and I think we haven't really seen him be able to be it's effective this year with those crosses partly because teams know what to expect from Liverpool partly because the offensive players have changed so you think oh it was always going to be Nunes as the striker just put it on his head Liverpool score really we haven't seen that connection too often he's gone on the left hand side but Liverpool need that variety they can't be predictable and it's just something else they can add to their collection that you're not going to really know who's running where. And when you think if it's Curtis Jones in midfield, Harvey Elliott in midfield, Henderson, well, they could go inverted, they can go on the wing. It just makes it a more unpredictable side to play against when you've got players who can cause all this mischief in the final third. With either foot, depending on their position, it certainly gives them the strength if they can make it a properly go of it in the weeks and months ahead. And like Corsi says, we don't know if it's going to be something that Liverpool will stick with and it's going to be a new formation. This is the new look of their side going forward. But it's still nice to have that variety there. It was when they were winning the Champions League, Premier League, they'd occasionally go to 4-2-3-1. That's not really been as effective this year, even though they did play it for those, those final moments against Arsenal. But yeah, it's always good to have those little backup systems in reserve just so you can change a game a different way. Absolutely. And I think like you guys have said, the next few weeks, the pressure's off a little bit, isn't it? Top four feels unattainable now. So, you know, a little bit of time to maybe experiment with these things. But let's move on now to what happened at halftime. I mean, we've, we've spoken a little bit about the feistiness of this game as an encounter in a general sense and how I think Arsenal made the mistakes, certainly in hindsight, of, of winding up the Liverpool crowd and not just trying to stay on the ball a bit more and, and try and go from 2-0 to 3-0. You know, they, they did try and 
stick with that. A little bit of a tactical time wasting from how it looked to me. And obviously, you know, Jacker incident and stuff like that. But Theo, I'll, I'll give you first crack at this. Our old mate, Constantine Hatsidakis. I think I've got his name right there. I hope I have. Have you ever seen anything like that unfold on a football pitch with, with an official getting into it with a player in that way? I, I don't think I have. Um, not in top flight European football. Like you'll maybe see the odd viral clip of it in South America and the, the lower leagues out there or something but when an official loses their head. But yeah, you certainly don't expect to see it here. Like they're the disciplinarians of the game. They're supposed to be cool, collective, be in control of the game. Like we've seen a few incidents in the last few weeks where players have put their hands on the officials, but nothing like that. Like Mitrovic has got what an eight game ban for his little shove on the referee. And the famous ones from De Canio pushing referee over in the, in the 90s. And you think the huge uproar there. And it just seems really surreal that it's the other way around. Like if Andy Robertson had put his elbow to a referee or assistant's face, like you oh, ban him for months. You just out this huge outroar. Oh, he's a disgrace. And while there has been this outroar against the assistant, I don't think anyone can really quite believe it. It's like, has that just happened? And I think it was um, one it might have been Maddo for the mirror he tweeted yesterday going, imagine if he'd done it to the England captain rather than the Scotland captain, how much like more it would hit home. Because it still it doesn't, you, you see the pictures of it and it still doesn't quite make sense. It's like we've all lost our heads playing sport at some point or another. Like, I've seen Gorsi lose his head so many times at the pits and then Thursday night footy for the Echo. Like, you know, it's a late challenge or something and you do have a little bit of a shove in match. But when you're an official, you're not supposed to do you've that. Got to, you've got to lose your head when Sharp Squires is round. <laughs> yeah. All game. I'll give you that one. But yeah, it, it doesn't come from the officials. Those are the ones in charge. They're supposed to be above that. And it's not as though Robertson's gone and touched him or anything. He's not done anything that can provoke that sort of reaction. Like well, The worst thing he's done is give him a bit of lip and he's got the elbow in the face for it. And yeah, maybe he doesn't quite know where he is. He's not able, meant there. He could be trying to shove him off. But it's still, you have a bit more responsibility about it. Uh, it's unprecedented. I can't remember an incident like this in major football for, for ever, really. Like I said earlier, it's just ones where you see it viral in South America and you laugh off going, oh, that's South American football for you, isn't it? It's those, those crazy scenes. Not... The Premier League football, where you got 55, 60,000 people watching inside the stadium and whole national audience at home, an international audience across the globe. Imagine they're going to throw the book at him because it's just something you can't do. Like I know they've come out today and said uh, he's not going to officiate any games until the investigation's gone. And it's like, is he going to get a chance to officiate a Premier League game again? Like we're seeing assaults get eight game bans for Mitrovic. Or if it's a bit more a Cantona Kung Fu kicking a fan, that was months. Do we have to make a stronger example of an official because they are supposed to be above that? They're not the ones that are letting their emotions decide things. Because as soon as an official brings emotion into a game, they cannot officiate that game fairly. Like they're supposed to be above it all, be this neutral. And as soon as the emotion comes into it, they've lost the respect, they've lost the game. That's the key point, isn't it? Of course, you know, it's. It's just who is doing this that is that is so shocking, really, to me. You know, and what do you think is the correct course of action here? Because because as we've said, this isn't a Thursday night kerfuffle in a in a little local game of football. This is this is one of the biggest games. You know, a team who are gunning for winning the Premier League and and Liverpool who are absolutely massive as well. And and yeah. just you know, this is unfolding and is a bizarre talking point after the game. Yeah, I was a little bit torn on this to be honest. Initially, I just I just thought and. Maybe a bit of a storm and a teacup. Let's move on. There are worse things out there. But then I think of if the shoe was on the other foot and, and how much, the, you know, whether it's Andy Robertson, Harry Kane, you know, could be any any footballer in the Premier League. Had there been any anyone, any one player who'd done the opposite, he'd be getting handed to Kingdom Come. You know, on the back of that, he'd probably end up on Good Morning Britain or something. You know, it was a kind of topic of discussion. Um, with all, all the outrage that had followed, so <clears throat> it's a difficult one. Um, he actually came past us, actually, um, Constantine with, with his um, the rest of the official team in, in the mix zone, and he's a big fella to be fair. I wouldn't like to take an elbow off him, so Andy Robertson's taken one, and to be fair, he's done well to, to stay on his feet because um, he is a bit of a unit. And the other, I know you spoke to John Aldridge today, didn't you, for his uh, his column. And, He's had some very pointed views on, on that as well. Um, yeah, some of it's not been uh, cleared to, for publication. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he wasn't quite as diplomatic as you calling him a big fella. Yeah. But yeah, some of it's interesting. So keep an eye out for that on the website later. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th I think it is right that there is a bit of an investigation into it all um, and see what comes of it. 
Um, I don't really know what what what, what happens in, in this situation. Um, the official, officials end up with with bans in the same way a player might. You know, Paolo Di Canio got banned for what was it, ten games for, for pushing Paul Alcock over in 1996 or whatever it was. Um, Mitrovic has just been given a ban. Was it eight games for Paul Heaney during the FA Cup game? Um, so it's going to be interesting to see, see what happens. Whether there's kind of a similar kind of disciplinary and protocol that, that they follow, I'm not sure, but certainly a bit of a new one, isn't it? You know, a, a referee aiming an elbow at a player. Um, so I think to bring new overall rule, rules into it as well, because if it had been the other way around and Robertson's elbowed the assistant in the face at half time, he gets sent off. He's not coming back out for that second half. Now, you can't really send off your own officials, but you think maybe there was a bit more control there. You swap him with the fourth official or something. You take him away from that direct role with the players because surely that is going to hamper his performance. Like the players are going to know what's happened and they're going to be a bit more aggressive towards him. Like it's a lot to ask what eleven footballers to forget that incident and not think like, yeah, it's just a bizarre situation. It's something they need to look at again. But then it's something that we'll probably never see again in <laughs> Premier League football. It'll be one of those clips that will just be designed to all those. Uh, like the show reels, when it or you see the eleven o'clock at night or something after Premier League matches, they've mm. done the highlights. Now we'll show the best bits or the most controversial moments. It'll just be. Do you remember when Andy Robertson got elbowed in the face by assistant referee in twenty twenty three? One thing. One thing I would say is that there seems to be a thing where <clears throat> referees and, and the kind of referees union. I mean, I might be wrong here, but they seem to think they're beyond reproach. Um, even when you know they, they, they do this thing now, don't they? With both Sky and, and BT, where they, they have like a referee in, in the studio for kind of their take on why a decision's been given. I can't think of too many instances where Dan McGallagher or Peter Walton have, have you know vehemently disagreed with with the referee's decision on the pitch. They just they seem to stand by them at every turn. They don't necessarily analyse why the decision's been made. It's almost just a blanket, you know, agreement with the official, whatever that is, and. That makes the whole thing redundant, really, doesn't it? That the whole referees watch type of thing. So, um, like things like you know Brighton getting an apology from from the was it the PGM OL over the weekend for some of the VAR decisions that went against them. Uh, I think it's happened to Everton a couple of times, has it? Where they've had apologies. You know, you don't get anything for, for an apology, do you? I think Brighton. I think it's the third time Brighton have, have had one of them this season. Um, after a certain point, you have to accept that these apologies are pretty meaningless, and you need to start getting these big decisions right. Um, and then that, that, I suppose, opens up a bit of a can of worms about the whole VAR debate. But I don't know. As a as a layman, you know, you can look at those Brighton decisions in particular at the weekend and go, "Well, that's a goal. That's a penalty. That's a penalty, or whatever it is." You don't need to be an experienced referee at elite level to to be able to. Get these decisions right, so I can't quite fathom why they are getting them wrong and why there are so many baffling decisions every single week. Yeah, it is bizarre, isn't it? And yeah, who knows what's going to happen with Constantine, Constantine the baddie uh, coming to a UFC card near you soon, perhaps. Who knows? Um, right, well, I don't really want to talk about the midfield, I think they were all okay. I think we could revisit them another day. We've spoken enough about them. Salah missed his pen. He's missed a couple of pens. You know, that's not great. Obviously, Klopp said that there'll be there'll be discussions about who takes the next one. I don't think there's much to be said there. But the, the, the last player I wanted to, to focus on a little bit was was Jota before we, before we sign off. Because I, I thought it was particularly pointed, you know, last January when I think he was kind of at his at his at his pomp, perhaps at, at Liverpool, you know, banging in a couple of goals against Arsenal on the way to the to the Carabao Cup. I remember tweeting at the time, here's a fella who's got hair like Barry Grant and feet like Robbie Fowler. He could just do no wrong. But but Gorsley, what what do you think's happened? I mean, it, it's it's is it just the case of the two injuries and the bad time and the, the one yeah. in preseason and another one that's knocked him out for what essentially amounts to half the season? Yeah. You know, I, but it's it's interesting this week. I think he's he's played a big part in all three games, hasn't he? He's been trusted at City, at Chelsea, and, and again against Arsenal. Do you think Klopp's just trying to play him back into a bit of rhythm and form? Yeah, that could be it, couldn't it? I think I think he likes Jota for certain games because. You get a little bit more of a, of a work rate down the other end, um, maybe help him back a bit more than Nunes does naturally. I know it's something Nunes has been working at, but 
I think that comes more naturally to Jota. <clears throat> but yeah, it's it's a difficult one because you know Jota got injured in July, wasn't it? In was it Thailand? Early July. Didn't come back until uh, early September. So that's best part of six weeks out injured there, and then he got injured for four and a half months, was it? In City, so you know those combined, he's, he's had six months out injured. Um, so expecting him to be near the levels of last season when I've just broke the entire uh, spare room. Yeah, so he scored twenty one goals last season. So expecting him to be near that level after such a long time out injured is probably unfair. Uh, and I think last season he had, you know, Sadio Mane and, and Mo Salah, who some people were talking about as, as being the best player in the world at, at certain points of last season um, to kind of cover for him at times. This time he, he's maybe trying to get back to full fitness at a time when Nunes is still adjusting. Certainly Cody Gakpo is and, and Luis Diaz has been out injured. So it's just a little bit of a perfect storm in terms of why the, the absence of you know, peak Joss has continued to go on. Uh, I'm not massively worried in, for the long haul. I just think um, the transitional nature of Liverpool's forward options uh, and the injuries that have affected certain players at, at certain points has just kind of all rolled into one and made it a bit difficult. And, and I think it's been, um, it's, it's put, probably put a bit too much responsibility on Mo Salah, to be honest, um, because... Every other player, for, for various reasons, is kind of adapting and adjusting for whatever reason. And Salah's just been expected to just carry on scoring at a rate of knots. And to be fair, he has got 24, but I think at times it has been a little bit unfair on him. I think we can actually take it back before the injury in the summer. Like I think it goes back to, we're saying, last February when he comes off. Was it a half-time at the San Siro? Like, he injured his ankle in February. Um, they rush him back for the League Cup final. And he's not really been the same at his best since like he was in and out the sides and there's many different factors to this one it takes a while to come back from an ankle injury because if you lose that strength in it it just takes one dodgy movement and it goes weak again and you're limping around two Luis Diaz came in took his place on the left was an electric form Sadio Mane is now the central striker he was scoring goals for fun so Jota wasn't given a consistent run in the team you think any player when they're getting close to 20 goals and then you go and spend 50 million on another forward who essentially takes your place that's going to take its toll on you mentally and you've got the physical strains there on his ankle like if you'd been able to key up on his scoring rates from out, throughout the whole campaign throughout those final two months then maybe Liverpool win the Premier League or win the Champions League and instead he just looked like he was lacking a little bit he wasn't as sharp he wasn't as confident and he's just not been able to catch a break since. Like today's a year since he last scored for Liverpool, which seems ridiculous considering this time last year he was second to what Mo Salah in Liverpool scoring chance. He, he was this sensational forward. There was so many chances about him. Everyone loves him. They still love him now. You just think, what is he providing? He was unlucky not to score yesterday. There was that chance in the first half where I think Ramsdale keeps him out from an acute angle. Was it that Henderson had the follow up there where he skied it? I think those were the two pieces together. But he's had a few uh, half chances where it's not quite fallen for him. He's won a couple of penalties. He's got the assist against Man City. He, he just needs something to go in off his backside or something. Because you think if he gets one, maybe he can go on this run. But at the same time, he's probably, for me, bottom of Liverpool's pecking order on the strikers. When Firmino goes, when everyone's fitting on form. Like Diaz that we saw before the injury, he starts, doesn't he? They've spent so much money on Nunes and Gakpo. They start as well. That with Salah, he's just got this new long-term contract. He's your, your first name on the team sheet. Jota realistically will come in for the odd game, but he's just going to be a substitute when you go in for a Champions League final. And it's like, well, if Liverpool need to raise funds, he's one of those few players you know you can get big money for if you want to sell. But deep down, you haven't got point on yourself. Jota won't want to leave, but he needs something to fall for him now because it has been a long year for him. And it's come from when he was at the, the peak of his powers. So if you'd said to him, January, February last year, yeah, you're only going to score a couple more goals for 12 months, you're going to miss the World Cup, everyone would have laughed at you then because he was in the form of his career. But he, he's still young, time is still on his side. He, he just needs his luck to turn, the same as Liverpool need their luck to turn. And hopefully that second half performance is a sign of it going the right way. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. Well, last point, and I'll come to you on this, Gorsi, before we sign off. Just a word really on... The Arsenal fans and an impeccable minute silence for, for Hillsborough ahead of the game. A distinct lack of any disgusting chance about tragedy. 
throughout the match. And it should not be remarkable that this is the case and that a fan base conducts itself in that, you know, very respectful, pleasant manner. But unfortunately, that is the case and, and it is a refreshing change. Yeah, 100%. Um, perfectly observed, been a silence for the victims of the Hillsborough disaster. And I don't think any of us would expect an anything on towards from the away end, given Arsenal as a club very secure in themselves, don't need to force a rivalry by, you know, sinking to any tawdry nonsense like that that we've had this season at Chelsea and Man City and, and Nottingham Forest, actually, which is probably most disappointing of the lot when we went to City Ground in October. Um, they're just they're a classic club, aren't they? To be fair to Arsenal, um, and I, I don't know whether some minds have been changed. I think early in the season, a few people I spoke to were uh, maybe not early in the season, but the last couple of weeks, a few people I've spoke to were saying that he hoped City would win the league over Arsenal just because you know an Arsenal team would have basically come from nowhere to be called the same number of titles as a Liverpool team. Who many are saying. Um, you know, it's the best of their lifetime, certainly. The, the, the thing I'm saying on Friday's podcast, it's certainly the best of my lifetime. Um, but having seen how the two clubs conduct, or the two sets of supporters, I guess, conduct themselves with regards to things like Hillsborough and, and whatever else, um, fair play to Arsenal if they go on and, and win the league now because um, they are a, a classic club. And, and um, you know, th- th- there was a... There was a rivalry there yesterday. It was it was heated. It was fiery, but it was um, it was never never even coming close to overstepping the mark with, with anything like that. And like you say, it's a, a refreshing change. Yeah, very well said, mate. Well, we will leave it there. That has been today's Blood Red podcast. Roll on Leeds United on the seventeenth. I think it is. Let's see if Liverpool can push this good feeling on and build on what we saw in that second half and, and keep that rolling for the rest of the season. So goodbye for the three of us. And as ever, thank you for listening. <laughs>